We'll just give it a minute for people to join. We've got quite a few with us uh, this afternoon. But while we're doing that, um, I can welcome all of you and um, uh, let you know that this is the second in our BC Provincial Summit on Aging keynote teaser series, uh, the men's shed movement around the world. I'm Barbara McMillan, United Way's BC's Population Health Provincial Community Engagement Coordinator, and I'm really pleased to introduce you to this session. I'd like to begin by recognizing that I'm speaking today from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish First Nations. And as this is a pan-Canadian webinar with participants from all across Canada, we also acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of all First Nations on which we gratefully work and gather. So to manage the session, because as I mentioned, we've got quite a few people on and uh, we want to ensure good quality and visual quality. There's a few details that I need to point out. Everyone but the presenters will remain muted and your cameras will be off. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box where you're joining from as well. And there's also a Q&A box where you can post your questions. And at the end of the presentations, we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A and discussion. And when you do post a question, please note who you would like to uh, direct it to. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Healthy Aging Core, both Core BC and Core Canada, along with the slides uh, uh, accompanying it in the next day or two. Also following the session, all participants will be sent a brief survey to provide feedback, and we encourage you to look for that and let us know what you think of this session and ideas for future webinars. So today's session is all about men's sheds, community-based groups that provide a safe, friendly, inclusive environment to gather and participate in activities. The purpose of a men's shed is to advance health and well-being of members and foster positive engagement within their community for the benefit of the community. The impact that men's sheds are having on their members and the communities that they're in has been really impressive and inspiring, and for many older men in particular, life-changing. We've seen this firsthand through our work in community, as well as directly with the Men's Shed Association of BC, which United Way British Columbia's Healthy Aging Team has been partnering with for the past few years. More recently, our partnership has deepened and we're currently working with MSABC to deliver Men's Shed startup and project grants and in co-hosting last week's Provincial Men's Shed Conference, a resounding success that, um, was I think the first men's shed conference in all of North America and it brought together almost 60 shedders from 17 site locations throughout BC of which nine are new sites. So today we'll learn how the men's shed movement which started in Australia in the 1990s has expanded to many countries including Canada. You'll also hear how MSABC is supporting the growing network of men's sheds in BC. And you'll also hear the story of two BC men's sheds, how they got started and their impact on members and their communities. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Dr. Barry Golding is adjunct professor in adult and community education of Federation University Australian in Ballarat, hope I'm pronouncing that right, a city in the central highlands of Victoria, Australia. He obtained his PhD in education from the University of Melbourne and has his leadership uh, positions and awards. There are many, but I'll just name a few, including Associate Dean, Research School of Education and Arts at University of Ballarat, founder of the Researching Adult and Vocational Education Group, patron of the Australian Men's Shed Association, and a member of the Order of Australia. In 2015, uh, Barry authored The Men's Shed Movement, The Company of Men. You can see it right, right there. Um, and uh, very recently, his second book entitled Shoulder to Shoulder, Broadening the Men's Shed Movement, um, launched, and I, I think it was just last week, uh, but B Barry can tell you, but certainly it was just in, in the last few weeks. Uh, our second presenter will be Mike Jennings, who learned about Men's Shed soon after he realized that he was going to be retiring. Uh, so he asked Doug Mackey of Men's Sheds Canada where the Coquitlam Men's Shed was, and he was told that there isn't one, so he needs to start a shed. He's founding member of that uh, shed in Coquitlam and soon also got involved with Men's Shed Association of BC to promote sheds across the province. Mike says that running a small business for 25 years has been very helpful in getting new sheds off the ground. 
After Mike will be David Friesen, the chair of Men's Shed Vernon. And David is a professor emeritus, University of Regina. He's a more recent resident of BC and uh, found Men's Sheds as a really great place to serve the community and meet others. With his wife, Eleanor, he enjoys spending time with his three sons and daughters-in-law and six grandkids. And our final presenter will be Reverend Scott Ager, who is with the Comox Valley Men's Shed. Uh, Scott is a retired Uni United Church of Canada minister, a grandparent, a hiker, and with his wife, Bev, a traveler. He enjoys singing in community choirs, drinking good coffee, I think I do too, um, and sampling locally produced beer and gardening, likewise. So without further ado, um, I will pass it over to uh, Barry to tell you all about Men's Sheds. Thank you, Barbara. Um, and thanks to everybody for um, being on this uh, important conversation today. Um, I, uh, I, I hear that you are um, acknowledging your First Nations people in, in Canada. Can I do the same here in Australia? I'm actually on Jadjawurrung country, one of 200 First Nations people in, um, in Australia. Uh, congratulations. We'll go to the next slide, I think, Ahmad. So um, congratulations to um, United Way, uh, British Columbia for in, uh, inviting me to present. And congratulations also to uh, Men's Sheds Association of British Columbia. Um, for helping gu us guide the way for more men's sheds in British Columbia, and I think providing an important beacon for, for Canada. So in terms of um, who I am and where I live and what I do, uh, I'm a 71 year old, um, partly retired uh, university professor. I live in a tiny town up in the hills out of Melbourne. And uh, as, apart from uh, researching and writing and publishing, I um, do a lot of uh, road cycling and, and gardening. Um, can I just acknowledge there is an important and emerging evidence base about men's sheds. Uh, my, my new book, which I'll talk about in a sec, um, uh, basically includes 179 articles, including uh, 69 journal articles. Uh, and that includes 70 um, peer reviewed articles. I've also um, written two books, which you can see on the screen. So we have quite an evidence base. And while men's sheds may be relatively new to Canada, and while the evidence base may be um, um, relatively limited in Canada. Um, I think this will change in the next few years. So next slide, please, um, Aman. So just to, to ground this conversation for those of you who might be new to Men's Shed, a Men's Shed is basically a community-based organisation open to all, providing a safe, friendly, inclusive, homely place to gather and participate in group activities. And the, the underlying purpose of a men's shed is to advance the health and well-being of members and to uh, foster engagement with the shed community for, for the benefit not only of the men involved, also for the, for the other men in the shed, but also for the wider benefit of the community. A little bit of history. Uh, the first men's shed was created in, this, in rural Australia just uh, 23 years ago in um, 1998. And uh, as of now, it's expanded to many countries, including to Canada. And I'll come to the, to the numbers and where they are a little bit later. But to this point, there's around 40 open to uh, 2021 20, in Canada, and it's still growing. Um, my best estimate is there's, there's around 2,800 men's sheds open worldwide to 2021. And uh, as many of you will know from the conference last week, the Men's Sheds Association of British Columbia 
is supporting uh, the growing network of men's sheds uh, in British Columbia in collaboration with, with United, Way, United Way. So next slide, please. I'd like to just focus uh, up front on what I think are the strengths you have in British Columbia, where um, the conference was last week. Um, and I think it's a good springboard for, um, for some of the rest of Canada. Although you're on the West Coast, uh, I think that you'll find that sheds will spread reasonably quickly uh, if our ex Australian experience is anything to go by and that you'll have hundreds of sheds within, within a few years. Um, I, uh, I acknowledge that COVID has knocked a lot of sheds very, um, and communities very hard. I believe that emergence from COVID will lead to a lot of new um, needs for probably a lot, of, lot more people out of paid work for longer than before. I observe that you have an energised and capable association in British Columbia. I think that the momentum that comes out of your recent conference will be very positive. Uh, we found here in Australia that conferences had a very um, positive and innovating effect. It's great to see that the British Columbia government is on side and assisting in some way. I know that there's many sheds in British Columbia that are willing to assist you. And I think it's important to acknowledge that you'll also get the encouragement from shedders and uh, sheds worldwide. This is one of the great things about men's sheds. It's a it's a shoulder to shoulder activity. We're all in this together. But I do identify the potential for British Columbia to become a light ship for shared development elsewhere in Canada. So well done to all those of you involved and, and thanks again to United Way. Next slide, please, Amon. Um, I've written this new book, Shoulder to Shoulder, basically to bring the world uh, up to date on what's happened in the, um, in the last uh, six years since my first book. So this gives you, um, it lists the chapters in the book. The yellow highlighted one is, is a chapter called Men's Sheds in Canada, which I've co-authored with Corey McKenzie from University of Manitoba. But you'll, you'll see sitting on the front is a very, very big chapter, over 100 pages about men's sheds in Australia. Uh, but there's also a heck of a lot of sheds in the UK and Ireland. There's around 130 in New Zealand. We've got uh, around 20 in um, the US around 30 in Denmark, and there's men's sheds elsewhere in the world, as I'll document a bit later. Um, there's also a new movement that hasn't yet come to Canada, but I think you should keep your eye on because I believe that it will become popular in many parts of the world. That's the women's shed movement. And I've co-authored the chapter about women's sheds with Lucia Carragher from Ireland. Chapter 11, as you can see, is about research evidence. Uh, since my first book. And my, the last chapter includes uh, a consideration of how the men's shed movement might be broadened in, in all sorts of ways. And uh, can I just note that the, the 2021 book index also includes an index for my first book. So it's a very big book, 444 pages. It's a solid read. It's a deep dive into men's shed. So if you're interested, Go and have a look. And um, this isn't a hard sell for the book. It's just telling you it's there if you if you can get an access to a copy. And I know that each of the sheds in British Columbia will have a copy sometime fairly soon. Okay, next slide. Um, I never intended to write a second book. Um, uh, about a year ago, I approached the publisher with a view to um, revising my first book. And they said, when they heard how things had changed in six years, 
they, the publishers convinced me I needed to write a new book. And the seven reasons for focusing on broadening shared reach are discussed in my book as I've listed here. The first one is that men's sheds aren't just for older white, rural, conservative, English speaking men. As in Canada, you've got lots of French speakers, you've got uh, First Nations men, you've got uh, immigrants, uh, uh, you've got refugees, you've got migrants, um, as we have here in Australia. And I think that men's sheds have to be more broadly attractive to all men. Um, my book shows that there's broader benefits than just to men. That includes benefits to men, benefits to communities, um, and, uh, and, and benefits also to women and families. Um, point four is that uh, sheds have shown themselves to be successful beyond English speaking contexts. There's a number of men's sheds in Australia, which are in Aboriginal communities where the first language is the First Nations language. There's, uh, there's now a men's sheds movement in Denmark, where although many Danish people speak English, the first language is Danish. And there's also four sheds in Iceland, uh, run by the, uh, sponsored by the uh, Icelandic Red Cross. So, Sheds have been shown to be successful beyond English speaking context. My other point is there's a need to broaden the shared bodies and um, importance of working together. And I mean, working together nationally, working together between, as we do here in Australia, uh, between states, but also as in Canada, you working together with, with the provinces. This will be important going forward. I've also identified the importance of the women's shed movement, which provides a whole new range of opportunities for broadening community reach. And can I just note here that many men's sheds in Australia already involve women. And the way they do this is, is included in my book. I won't talk about it now, but you need to know that some men's sheds are actually also for women, even though that's not on the name of the shed. And that was fascinating for me when I was writing this book. And the other reason for broadening our services and programs is because COVID-19 has happened and we've found new ways, including uh, ways of working online and working via radio and Zoom, which have uh, broadened the way we do stuff as a consequence of COVID. And this will become increasingly important down the track. Thank you, next slide. So there's seven national chapters in my book, as you saw in one of the previous slides. So the Canadian chapter, for example, introduces the broad context for sheds in Canada. It, there's a map which shows where sheds are in Canada. It revisits uh, case studies around the world. Unfortunately, we didn't have any case studies in 2015. Uh, from Canada, but there are a whole lot of new case studies as well, including quite a few from Canada. Each chapter, including the Canadian one, teases out how men's sheds are organised and networked nationally and in your case within provinces. It introduces new case studies um, and there's actually five new case studies from Canada. And uh, each chapter also looks at how COVID affected sheds and how sheds uh, responded to that challenge. And each chapter also provides an overview of the evidence and looks ahead at what might happen down the track. So this is a, a serious book with a serious look at what's happening right up to uh, the present. Thank you, next slide. Here's a summary of the, uh, the case studies that are in my book. You'll see in total there's 131 case studies down the bottom right uh, total, but um, there's, uh, 
there's case studies from all of those countries, Australia, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, Ireland, New Zealand, US, Canada. And you'll see there's uh, included, there's eight women's sheds uh, case studies to give you a flavour of what's happening in um, women's sheds around the world. But as you can see from the table so far, women's sheds are only found in um, Australia, the UK, and although it's not on this, uh, there's no case study, there's actually three um, women's sheds that are actually in New Zealand. Next slide, thanks. So a couple of big questions. Uh, why do they work and who do they work for? Um, I can't answer all these questions in the brief time that I've got, but I pose these as questions because they're questions that you need also to answer. I don't have the answers about who sheds will be for in Canada and who they'll work for or how they might be set up or who will take part. This is something that you will decide at the level of community. Similarly, what do participants do in sheds? Well, um, uh, it's basically whatever the, the men and community decides they want to do. The word men's shed doesn't say what should or shouldn't be in, 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 the, in the shed. It just basically said it's a, it's a shed. And that's important. It's not a woodwork shed. It's not a health shed. It's not a craft shed. It can be all of those things, but the name is not on the shed. Sheds have got to do with social inclusion uh, and therefore about health and well-being. While health and well-being is important, they're not included in the name of the shed. How the sheds are managed is done locally. Uh, the role of women in sheds is decided locally. In some communities, including here in Australia, women are equal members. In some, in many sheds here, it's just a men's shed, but that's a decision that's made at a local level. The question of how the reach, impact and range of participants can be broadened is again an issue that, uh, that I address in the book. Uh, but my argument is that in the end, shed should reflect the diversity that exists in, in each, uh, each community that they're developed in, and therefore they'll be different. Uh, sheds aren't like McDonald's or, or KFC. It's a different product <laughs> in each shed and it's determined locally. So let's go to a quick uh, shed movement history. Next slide, thanks. Um, the first shed in Australia opened in 1993. It was just called the shed. At that stage, no one was going to call it a men's shed. The first men's shed opened in the state I live in, in Victoria. In, it was called the Dick McGowan Men's Shed after Dick McGowan who invented it. Um, the Australian Men's Sheds Association was, was created nine years later in um, 2007. So we've been going here um, gangbusters ever since. And there's, uh, there's uh, a heck of a lot of sheds here in Australia, as you'll see in a later slide. New Zealand started in 2008, same year Canada started, as you can see in yellow, and the Canadian Men's Shed Association started in 2013. The Irish got going in 2019, the first women's shed opened in Australia in 2010, uh, separate from the men's sheds, but as you'll see later, some of them were actually doing stuff together with men's sheds. Um, UK uh, has probably been the most significant growth in the last few years, particularly in um, England, Scotland, and huge growth in Wales um, since 2013. The Danish have got in on the act and there's a, there's a men's shed movement, not called men's sheds because that wouldn't be understood in Denmark. They're called men's meeting places in, Dem in Danish. And they got, got started in the US in 2016. And they're also growing very quickly there. 
So next slide. Here's uh, the situation as of now in Canada. Um, basically, uh, pre-COVID, there were 40 men's sheds in five provinces in three main shed clusters, uh, southwest of uh, British Columbia and Alberta, uh, southern Manitoba and southeast Ontario and Quebec. Um, low national shed density in Canada to the, to the, and this is not making a judgment, it's just acknowledging that you've got 1 50th of the number of sheds we've got per head of population in, in, um, in Canada. Uh, and, but interestingly, Manitoba, the density is higher at about 0.7 per 100,000 population. My book includes five shed case studies, as you can see there, from um, two from British Columbia, one in Alberta, one in Manitoba and one in Ontario. And can I just acknowledge that many of the early sheds in Canada were initiated by Doug Mackey and he did some great pioneering work. But I also acknowledge that the Canadian Association work tended to plateau in recent years. And I predict that some of the next growth will likely come via the provinces, including via uh, British Columbian Association following your conference. And I, I do acknowledge that there's a huge potential for men's sheds to spread to the Atlantic East, including in Francophone areas, to First Nations men, and with wellbeing and health focus. Um, I also think it's important to acknowledge that uh, it's important to emphasize and promote shed diversity so that sheds are more representative of Canadian um, men's diversity. I think this should be something we do going forward, not just increasing number of sheds, but increasing the shed diversity. Next slide, thanks. Uh, here's the numbers of men's sheds and women's sheds open worldwide to 2021. Um, you can see Canada is a reasonably, reasonably new kid on the block, but growing rapidly. Uh, we have 1,300 sheds across Australia uh, with a shed density, as you can see in the middle column of 5.1 sheds per 100,000. But if you go down the list, you'll see Ireland, which has 391 sheds with a shed density of 8.3 per 100,000. So Ireland is currently shed heaven in terms of the number of sheds per head of population. But there's also a lot of sheds, as you can see, in Wales, Scotland, um, and New Zealand. Uh, but you can see from the bottom of the table that sheds are starting to spread uh, also into uh, into Europe. And of course, in the right hand column, you'll see that there's a number of um, what I call peak body associations, that is men's shed associations. Uh, someone asked in one of the earlier slides, what about women's sheds? Um, uh, how are they managed? Well, at the moment, they don't sit under any umbrella although uh, they are being supported in Ireland and Australia in an informal way by the, uh, by the peak bodies. Um, and certainly the men's sheds associations acknowledge that this is a positive move for women who want to be involved in shedding. And in some cases, but not all cases, uh, there'll be opportunities for men's sheds and women's sheds to exist under the one roof. And this is already happening in the UK and Australia. And there's some great case studies in the book which talk about how that's actually managed. Some sheds have women's sheds on two days, men's sheds on two days, and other stuff happening in the shed on other days, all under the one roof, organised by one or more organisations. So. There's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. This is 
my important message. And down the side, you'll see that uh, there's lots of different uh, men's sheds associations. And uh, so we'll go to the next slide, I think, Aman. Um, I'm posing a number of what I call shed challenges in British Columbia and more broadly in Canada. And I'm putting out a couple of tips. Firstly, you need to decide on who you want in the shed and what sort of gender composition you want in the shed. It's not for me to tell you that you should have women in the sheds, but I do believe it's a conversation you should have. I also believe that you should have a conversation about whether you just want it to be older men. Because if all of the images on your websites are older men, you'll tend to get older men. If all of the uh, images on your websites are white men from uh, white conservative men, that's the sort of uh, demographic you'll tend to attract. You need to provide images of diverse ages and diverse uh, genders and ethnicities, um, including black and First Nations men, uh, in order to increase your diversity. My, your challenge also is to secure um, provincial and or national government funding, as we've done here in Australia. And I acknowledge that the Australian Men's Sheds Association is actually supported significantly by the, our Australian national government under the Australian Men's Health Policy. But I also acknowledge that there's ways of uh, getting funding, securing funding for sheds as a health and wellbeing strategy, as a community building strategy, as a post-COVID strategy, as a rural strategy, as an ageing strategy, as a First Nations strategy, and also for involving war veterans, as, as it does in many countries. And this is, these are all really important to acknowledge. I think it's important that you develop new sheds, but you also support your existing ones. I also argue that you should be getting more shedders actively involved. Um, and uh, so I guess my tips would be um, broaden and consider your gender. Um, have a look at how we, sh we fund sheds here in um, Australia uh, and maybe learn some lessons. Look at how sheds are networked in different places in the world and decide what you want to do and also decide on how you're going to broaden your shed reach because I think this, is, this needs to be our big focus in the next few years, uh, wherever there are men's sheds movements. So next slide, thanks, Amal. Um, the conclusion in my book basically is that uh, sheds are expanding and making huge and positive contributions to men, families and communities in diverse settings worldwide. The movement's clearly broadening, changing and adapting, uh, including to new and cultural uh, and national contexts, including in Canada. I also observed that COVID has a huge impact on sheds and one that we need to plan for and address. Uh, the next point is that men sheds has to be more inclusive, more diverse men, um, involving um, a number of organisations and peak bodies, all ideally working in harmony. We haven't always got that right here in Australia. I also acknowledge that we need to have good research evidence uh, in order to convince governments and non-government organisations. We also need to acknowledge that women's sheds are, have the potential to complement the work done in men's sheds. And it's also important to understand why the shed model works. And if you want to know why it works in detail, uh, read the last chapter in my book. And there's many uh, creative ways of making sheds more inclusive and sustainable. 
uh, inclusive of some women and inclusive of uh, younger people. And so my message is in the book and in more, more broadly, let's broaden the reach uh, to make sheds inclusive, but also make sheds more sustainable. Because if it's all always going to be older, older men, uh, old men eventually get sick and die. And um, if we want to have healthy sheds and sustainable sheds, we need to have renewal. And we need to have uh, new men. And we need to have uh, men and people who are, who are, um, who are inclusive of uh, the broader community in uh, both the, inside the shed and outside the shed. And so my message is, let's broaden the reach of men's sheds. And um, this is good for men, good for men's health uh, and wellbeing and incredibly good for the community. So that's all I've got to say. Um, I think I'll now hand over to Barbara. Uh, who will have some questions. I'm sorry I might have gone a few minutes over, Barbara, but it's time for you to take over. Thank you. That, that was really terrific, Barry. Thank you so much. Before we get to questions, and we do have a few in the chat box that I will bring um, following the, the um, BC presenters, uh, but first we'll hear from um, Mike Jennings, who is the president of the Men's Shed Association of BC. Mike. Thank you. I have a short history of the Men's Sheds Association of British Columbia. Um, MSABC was created by Jim Gracie and the Squamish Men's Shed and incorporated in December 2017 to foster the well being of men, to collectively purchase goods and services, represent men's sheds and interests, uh, provide advice to the public about men's sheds, sustain existing sheds, and encourage the formation of new sheds, and also to build relationships. In 2018, a liability insurance policy was negotiated, negotiated uh, that could be shared between all the sheds needing coverage. We established a province-wide communications with a ragtag group of sheds. In 2019, there were 12 sheds. We had more or less monthly virtual meetings, which developed into relationships between the sheds. This was a period when sheds grew in size and maturity, and MSABC is, is beginning to embrace its role. In 2020, virtual meetings have continued through the COVID crisis with sheds sharing their triumphs, triumphs and tribulations, all trying to learn from one another. Still in 2020, United Way provides funding for MSABC with the object of increasing the number of sheds in BC by 30 over three years and increasing the capacity of MSABC to fulfill its purpose. In 2021, grants were established for startup sheds, as well as project grants for established sheds. sheds. Now there are 17 sheds in British Columbia. In October 2021, Squamish, BC was the home of the first men's shed conference in Canada, probably the Americas. It was a great success. There were many great suggestions which will keep us busy well into 2022. All of the BC Sheds are members of MSABC and united in purpose. That's the history of MSABC in a nutshell. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. Mike's being pretty modest about that. Um, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about MSABC and what they've been achieving, uh, but that will be for another day. Uh, meanwhile, you can go to the MSABC website to check it out. So now we will hear from David Friesen, who is with the uh, Vernon Men's Shed. David? Thank you, Barbara. Now, our story in a nutshell, uh, three founders were meeting in 2018 and uh, I guess one of them had heard about Manshed and uh, 
they started talking about uh, starting one in Vernon. And uh, so they started holding meetings and it attracted people to these meetings. I was one of those. I had never heard of Men's Shed and had just moved into the province and into Vernon and uh, got to know one of the guys and was invited to the meetings. And uh, before we knew it, um, one of the guys had lined up uh, a small shop uh, on the premises of a local um, storage uh, company. And uh, it was unheated, unserviced, uh, no parking, uh, and it seemed to have all the factors to prevent any kind of growth of a men's shed. But anyways, uh, some of us referred to it as a sandbox. It was kind of a place where we went and uh, not much organization and uh, you did a few things. And before we knew it, we were getting involved in projects, building things for various nonprofits in the community. Uh, soon we realized that um, with the kind of space we had, uh, we weren't going to grow very quickly. So we needed to develop the organization, needed to become a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, we linked up with uh, Canadian Mental Health Association and became a program of theirs and um, uh, went down that road for close to a year and um, uh, found them a great resource and a great way to get us established. Uh, but there were some barriers in terms of us being independent. So we sought society status and established that in 2020. Uh, one of the things that we did, and we look back on now, which is absolutely key, is we uh, uh, developed a five-year plan. And uh, we had a vision. We knew we couldn't stay where we were. We could get evicted at any time, uh, depending on how the owner felt towards us. And fortunately, he was uh, uh, very much in favor of what we were doing and support of what we were doing. But we really needed to get out of there and so we developed a mission vision and um, uh, decided that we really needed to start looking for a place to meet that was larger and would allow us to expand in a place where uh, there are lots of men who have moved here and uh, had nothing to do and, and needed to become part of something with a purpose. Uh, the long and the short of it is here we are in 2021 and on August 1st, we signed a five-year or a three-year lease with an option on another two lease two years on a 5,200 square foot facility, a beautiful facility with a lovely social area, large shop, uh, and a place that we're very proud to be in. Uh, but soon we began to realize, uh, just as of today, we hit our 75th member, which is a long way from where we started in 2018. So you can see that we've come a long way in a very quick period of time. Uh, we've got a membership growing, We've got expanded capacity in order to offer other kinds of programs. We've got the space to do it now, but we've also got more to maintain and more to run. And so this image came into my mind, you know, that little image that could, or the, I'm sorry, the little engine that could, puffing uphill with just a couple of cars behind and a small crew pushing from behind to get us up the hill. All of a sudden in 2021, we found ourselves at the top of the hill. And it seems now that we're going down like a diesel locomotive we're almost out of control and the crew's not behind us anymore. They're in front of us trying to lay the track so we can keep going. And uh, it's kind of that kind of excitement that we're into right now. And I was just reflecting on it. What have we learned from this? Well, a whole bunch of things, but there are three that I want to just land on really quickly. I think one thing that has really helped from the beginning is a strong focus and connection to the community, uh, doing projects for nonprofits, uh, developing relationships with uh, some businesses, um, uh, working with other clubs. Uh, just recently, a couple of days ago, we were named uh, runner up uh, to a recent Chamber of Commerce award for nonprofits, and really an exciting thing in the short period of time that we've been around. The other thing that I think we've learned is really important is keeping the guys together. Uh, a lot of uh, sheds and clubs and so on have shut down or did shut down in March 2020 when COVID began. And one of the things that we did, we, we shut down for a very short period of time and kind of regrouped. But one thing we offered every Monday morning is a nine o'clock Zoom meeting. And uh, kind of interesting, uh, it has continued to even yesterday meeting on Zoom again. We've missed one Monday since March 2020. So it's been a great way to keep the guys together. Another thing is our website. We're currently revising it. 
and using it as a way to keep the guys on the same page. We have a wonderful newsletter that goes out uh, as often as weekly and uh, uh, just a great way to keep the guys uh, informed of what we're doing and what we're all about. The third thing that um, has been really important to the development of our shed is having projects that engage the men. And we have three types of projects in our shed. Uh, guys come in and, and do their personal thing. Uh, we do community projects for nonprofits. And we also do uh, projects that support the shed that are bringing in some income. I would say our biggest challenge right now is um, fully engaging uh, the growing membership. Uh, like I mentioned before, we're a train that's going very quickly and uh, we're having to uh, move in many, many directions right now, trying to get the guys all on board to help. Uh, and uh, believe we have an exciting future ahead of us. Barry's reminded us of some of the territory that we can start moving in. Uh, we're gonna have a dream uh, type of event in January where we get all the guys together and say, what do we want now? The old model's not working, starting in a small shed. Uh, we're growing. What could we do for this community? What's, what's our dream? And uh, that's kind of where we're at with the uh, men's shed burning. Thanks, Barbara. Great, thank you so much, David. Uh, now we're gonna go from the interior of BC over to the island and hear from Scott. Hi, thanks. It's a very uh, fulfilling and interesting uh, afternoon. Thank you to everyone. Um, our Comox Valley shed was birthed out of what used to be a youth room in a church. The room was abandoned and filled with all manner of things, old chairs, abandoned floor covering, books, a worn out piano and ancient files. What was once a room filled with young people gathered around a pool table had gone silent and empty. So we cleared out the room. We removed a wall of ancient cupboards and found new storage locations for things that we could not throw out. We installed new cupboards, a sink, and strategic shelving to hold tools. One of our members built a fine workbench. Books about building things soon filled the shelves. Tools were stored in new cupboards. Walls came to life again with fresh coats of paint. Our men replaced a fence on the edge of the church property. We created a large sign for an all candidates meeting in the church building. We were starting to meet regularly also for coffee, timbits, and conversation, planning our future. And then COVID-19 hit, and we have had to gather in other ways, meeting in parks in good weather, at the local golf course when it was wet, but trying to keep that relationship alive with the eight or 10 people involved in the shed. We're a small shed, but we wait with cautious optimism. I am nevertheless encouraged by the images of hundreds of communities of shed worldwide coming together to stand not so much face to face as shoulder to shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder with one another, with a project important, but yet second to the closeness that happens when folk with generous hearts gather. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Scott. Um, and those uh, stories from Vernon and from Comox Valley are just a couple of the hundreds and hundreds of stories of sheds uh, throughout Canada and other parts of the world. In fact, thousands of stories. And I've certainly had the privilege of um, hearing many stories through my work um, and uh, being able to uh, tour some communities, visit sheds, and uh, certainly in preparation for the conference last week in Swamish, uh, back in the summer, we just spent an hour walking around downtown Swamish, and there were at least half a dozen community projects that uh, were pointed out that the men's sheds had a part in. Everything from intergenerational activities that involved um, bringing uh, kids, I think they were like eight to 11 year olds, uh, to learn some of the basics of woodworking in the shed uh, in, the, in the summer, to working with the local food bank to build um, uh, garden beds and all, all manner of activities. And that's taking place uh, with every shed uh, in BC and uh, throughout the country. So really exciting to hear 
And, you know, some of the things that I've really picked up is that uh, while there are certainly commonalities from one shed to the next, there's also a lot of differences. If you've seen one shed, you've seen one shed. And so they're all unique. And as I think Barry uh, so well put it, um, how sheds operate, what they focus on, when they meet, all of those things are determined at that local level um, by the shed members themselves and really reflect um, what's uh, of most interest and, and uh, use in the community. Uh, so there, there's lots of information that, that you can get about sheds. We've, we've got a few questions here. Some have actually already been answered, um, but uh, we will start with uh, Brian's question of, um, uh, to any or all of the panelists actually, is there a danger of trying to be all things to everybody that you will lose the original key audience? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start with that one. Can I just say that uh, I really enjoyed listening uh, to, uh, intently to both David and Scott talk about their sheds and also, of course, to Mike talking about Men's Sheds BC. Look, you guys are doing some great work and while it might seem like you've only got eight or ten people involved at the moment, the potential for increasing... Um, the uptake of men's sheds is huge. What we found in Australia is at some point, the media will pick this up and it'll become very, um, very newsworthy. Here in Australia, everybody now knows what a men's shed is. You don't need to explain it anymore. And see, it's even getting to a point where women's sheds here are almost well known enough for people to at least heard of them. So um, I think that, uh, the question of whether they, whether there's a danger of being all things to everybody, um, I don't actually think there's a problem. Uh, a shed can be whatever it wants to be. And if the local community decides it's mainly for young kids who've fallen out of school, why not? Um, if on two days a week the shed is not used by anybody and a group of women come and say, can we use the shed? Uh, and help you with the maintenance and, um, and uh, contribute to the organisation, is that a problem? <laughs> if a group of Vietnam veterans come and say, can we meet there on a, a Thursday night and do our stuff? What's the problem? I don't actually think it's a problem um, trying to be inclusive. I think it's actually more of a problem being exclusive. Uh, because, you know, organisations which aren't inclusive die. Um, and in the end, we have to get good at being inclusive. I'm not saying that you, you stop having a shed just for men. Uh, that is important. And it's important for some men to just have a space to be just with men. But that doesn't have to mean that on other days it can't be something else. So that's my response to the... Can I just address another question, which I can see on the text, Barbara, just to, to jump in. Someone asked, what are women's sheds called? Well, uh, believe it or not, they're called women's sheds, um, much the same as men's sheds, but in some places they actually call them by other names. There's a couple in the UK where they call them she sheds. Um, and there's a couple here in Australia, which although uh, they're called women's sheds. The blokes tend to call them she sheds for some reason. Um, some of them call them Sheila's shack. Um, there's all sorts of ways of spinning it. And what they call themselves really is, again, according to, um, to uh, you know, what you decide. Um, I also saw, Barbara, if I could just jump in, I did have a quick look at the questions. I know this is your job to field the questions, so I thought I might save you a bit of time. Um, someone on the chat line said, I've only been a member for two weeks and I'm a white Anglo male. Maybe I'm, I'm starting to feel I'm not what you're looking for. Can I just say to that, that person, don't feel that way. In the end, it's, it's the responsi responsibility of white Anglo males, including myself and Scott and David, because I can see you're also white Anglo males. It's our job to make sheds inclusive. It's not, 
it's it, it sh you shouldn't feel threatened by this you should be actually feel empowered and innovated if you're a white anglo male and you're online it's our job to make sheds more inclusive it's not it's not black men's job to come in and take over it's our job to make them inclusive that's the way i see it so they're just three of the questions i saw barbara and someone just posted how do i get the book well, if you go online on Google and you put in the title, you'll find it comes up. But it's actually sold at the moment in hard copy or in soft cover through Common Ground um, uh, Publishing in, uh, in Illinois. It's being published in the US. So it's available for purchase online. Great. Thanks, Barry. Um, just back on the question about the diversity of sheds. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough uh, to be speaking just a couple of weeks ago to the secretary of the brand new Alberta Men's Shed Association. So they've created a, a provincial network there. And uh, Merv Graham there was telling me about, um, I believe he's in Calgary, that um, about the, the bike shed um, that they had got going before COVID and uh, focus on cycling and women were involved in that, but a big part of their community work was around getting donated bikes repairing them. So that was the, the work of the shedders and then donating them to refugee families. You will also hear about a variety of sheds in one community. Um, hopefully most of you will be able to participate two weeks from now in the third and final session of this series. Um, and uh, one of the presenters will be talking about um, uh, men's sheds in Froome, uh, which is in Somerset County in the in England. And uh, uh, Patrick tells us that there are four sheds there. There's the, the original men's shed, there's a women's shed, there's a maker's shed, uh, which is really intergenerational. And they were in the process of getting a transition shed started. And so some of you might be familiar with uh, transition communities, which are focused on uh, transitioning from carbon. Um, so really about uh, environment and sustainability. Um, did, did any of the other presenters have any more comments on that question? Yeah, I, I've, I've got a comment on it. It seems to me the flip side of the coin on that question of uh, who should be in a men's shed is uh, who, who are you serving? And what's your mission and vision? And uh, for us, it's been really, really important to have a very strong mission and vision so that uh, we are always looking out from the shed, and that is, uh, how can we help nonprofits? How can we help the community? How can we do something for the community? And I think that's the thing that attracts men, and it attracts uh, different kinds of men, younger ones, older ones, uh, the diversity, and so on. So I think mission and vision is really important. Great, thank you. So we're I, getting- I said, uh, David, I totally, totally agree with what you just said. It's about looking out rather than looking in. And, and sometimes sheds try and work harder within, but they don't look, look out. And you really do have to look out uh, into the community and look at the community and say, how diverse is our community? Are we inclusive of that diversity? And if, you, if, if you're not, what do you do about it? Because it's, it's your job to make it inclusive. It's, it's not a matter of just waiting for people to walk in the door. Could I just also say to Barbara, again, this is not a pitch for the book, but the Frome Men Shed that you mentioned that uh, Patrick Abrahams in, in the UK has talked about is one of the case studies in my book. Great, uh, thanks. Thanks, Barry. So um, we are running low on time, but um, I want to just, because obviously there's a lot more that we can talk about, but for more information, you can follow up on the books. You've now got the links for, for Barry's books um, and also uh, Men's Shed Canada and the MSABC website. And of course the recording of this session and the, the previous one on social prescribing uh, of this series are all available on Healthy Aging Core. And I believe the, um, this, the links are in the chat box. Um, and also uh, check out Help Age Canada um, because they are involved in uh, delivering some startup grants for new men's sheds outside of BC. So if you are outside of BC, you can contact Help Age uh, Canada. Beth there would be happy to speak with you inside BC. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, contact me. 
and uh, and yeah, reach us anytime with um, with questions or if you'd like um, more information about anything that you've heard today, we can direct you uh, to any of the presenters or or other um, parts of the the Men's Shed Network. And so to end our session. I really want to extend a huge thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, we so appreciate you sharing your expertise and your time with us today. And we really also appreciate the important work that you're doing outside of the, your shed. So locally, provincially, nationally, and globally to grow this important movement of men helping men. So thank you, Barry, Mike, David, and Scott. We really appreciate uh, your um, being with us today. Uh, in conclusion, I would also like to extend an invitation, um, as I mentioned earlier, to join us for that third and final session of the series, uh, taking place Tuesday, November 16th at 9 a.m. Um, uh, Pacific time. Uh, it's called the Compassionate From Project, a community approach to addressing isolation that works. And uh, it's a follow up to the first session that was held two weeks ago that focused on social prescribing, as I mentioned, and today's Men's Shed um, session. Um, and it will look at how programs like social prescribing and men's sheds with, when integrated with other community based initiatives like, uh, you know, volunteer connections and, and community cafes can result in measurable improvements in individuals health and wellness, uh, reduced isolation and a more supportive and compassionate community overall. So Patrick Abrahams, who I've mentioned, uh, who is uh, with Men's Sheds in Froome and also with the UK Men's Shed Association, and Julie Carey Downs with Health Connections Mendip, will describe how, through paying attention to people's community networks, uh, Health Connections Mendip uh, in Froome um, in the UK reconnects people to both their own supportive network and the extensive community activity that already exists. So since they began their work, um, their collective work to combat isolation, the whole area has seen a dramatic fall in emergency hospital admissions and, and other measures. And uh, their success is really based on making routine use of social relationships, just the way that men's sheds do. The most effective intervention for improving health and longevity. So the impact of this holistic approach has resulted in what's commonly known as the Froome model of enhanced primary care, which is gaining worldwide attention and serving as a model for many other communities. So I hope to see you at that session in two weeks. Registration information is in the chat box. And in conclusion, I would also like to thank um, Aman, our uh, tech person who has been operating behind the scenes and has been really instrumental uh, both uh, in running the session today, but also in uh, helping to organize it. So thank you to Aman, to all of our presenters and to all of you out there in community who are uh, contributing so much to uh, uh, individual and community health and wellness. Take care and uh, hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you.